Hey everyone, welcome to the Reptile Barn. Uh, in light of our sailfin clutch that we have in the incubator right now, which we just figured out was all... Here, let me put her down, let her run around. Which we just figured out was all, uh, all fertile, all six of our eggs, we decided to do a sailfin video. Now we've done kind of more deep dives on the indigos, on the Dominican red mountain boas, and we decided it was a good time to do something for the sailfins too. So this here, as many of you know, is Sophie, our Philippine sailfin dragon, the first that we got. And she is very well socialized. We yeah. can feed her. She's, she's our most socialized lizard that we have. Oh, okay. She wants it all. It'll drop. She'll <laughs> it off the ground. So, first of all, we, right now, are only working with Philippine sailfins, the Hydrosaurus pustulatus. And if I'm butchering the, uh, the scientific name there, it's because I've only ever seen it written. Uh, and nobody, nobody actually <laughs> speaks Latin. The deal with a lot of these things. We all butcher it. Uh, there is some controversy, there's a lot of disagreement among experts on the classification of the various types and you know maybe a scientific paper has been published since the research that I've done and things have changed but generally the most widely accepted are is the Philippine sailfin, the Amboyensis and the Weberi or the Weber's sailfin. And the Weber's and the Amboyensis are the Indonesian varieties and the Philippines are obviously from the Philippines. So I don't know why, but every single time I put her down in here, she oh. comes to this cage and looks for little blue. She, she just wants to, I'm not sure if she feels like territorial or curious or what, but she obviously knows he lives in there and she comes and looks inside his cage every time I get her out. It's just interesting. So back in the early 90s, the Philippine sailfins were being heavily exported. And so they were what everyone found, they were what almost everyone had, and they were a lot cheaper back then. But I think in 1994, somewhere around there in the mid-90s, the Philippines stopped exporting them because their numbers were starting to get threatened. And the roles kind of switched where the other two became uh, much easier to find, and that is still the case today. So when the Philippines stopped exporting the uh, Pustulatus sailfins, the Amboyensis and the Weber sailfin kind of took over in the in the reptile trade, and and those are now the price is is generally cheaper, especially on the Weber sailfins, and both of those varieties are just much easier to find. So we actually spent. I don't know how long did we spend looking for. Oh my gosh! It, it was for an it was adult, a process. especially. Yeah, it was a process to to find them. We actually got really lucky with her. Actually, if you want to tell them that story, since you kind of. Oh yeah. So um, Caleb has spearheaded everything with the sailfins, um, and uh, we decided to try and find adults. So we searched and searched and searched and searched and searched. It was six months. Yeah. And then we came across. A um, couple animals for sale by Anthony Sains, who's very well known for rare lizards, uh, excellent reputation, um, and he had a couple of females and a male listed. And at the time, we were silly and we're like, well, let's just get one right now and we'll get another one later. <laughs> so we bought her. Um, well, and we were also a little short on we, Yeah, we didn't have the money to just buy a whole group of them at the time. So we got her, and she's been fantastic. But then, by the time we were ready to get a male, Anthony Sainz's male was no longer available, and we couldn't find a male and couldn't find a male. It was how long did we have her? Eight, ten months before we finally found I the male. I think it was about that, yeah. Um, so then we bought the male, but he was a little bit young um, to breed. So then we had to wait even longer. <laughs> so this poor girl was in her prime, ready to have eggs, and we just um, finally ended up finding this male, and we're glad we settled on him, because his coloration is just spectacular. Um, but, uh, yeah, so she came from Anthony Sains. Who, who was the, what's the company that we bought him from? I can never remember their name. 
Oh, I'll find it and we'll put it in the description here because yeah. they were great to work with as well. All right, you want to walk us through some husbandry, um, temperature, enclosure size, food. Yeah, so, well, we have their food here, so I'll go over the food okay. first. This is just kind of an example of what we'll have on hand for the sale fins at any given time. So, generally, with the younger sale fins, they will, from the egg, they will be predominantly insectivores. So, the, but what you have to realize and, and remember is that as they get older, that kind of shifts, and there, again, there's some disagreement on the level to which that shifts, but just roughly, uh, as, as a baby and an adolescent, they're going to be about 75% insectivore to about 25% salads, and as they get older and mature, that evens out at about 50-50. But with the salads in particular, you want to go at a ratio of about 70% greens, 20% vegetables and 10% fruits. So just as a typical salad that I would make for them, right now I kind of cycle between uh, an organic spring mix which has quite a variety of greens in it and an organic uh, rainbow kale mix that has I believe three different types of kale. So between those, you know, they'll, they'll go through this in a week, a week and a half because we have two of them and I also feed it to the roaches, but um, cycling between those two, you know, we have probably 15 different types of greens that they get. So they get a very good variety of greens. And so that's the bulk of their salad. And then we just have things like uh, celery, Carrots, cucumber, zucchini, apples, bananas, so really just any organic fruits and vegetables and grains that you can find are, are pretty much going to be good. You kind of want to avoid things like iceberg lettuce that have almost no nutritional value and uh, uh, just and plain spinach too you don't really want just because it's you, they really need the variety as much as you can give them. Um, what else? Everything so, that they eat is organic, including their insects. Right. Uh, their insects only eat organic fruits and vegetables and grains. Right. Yeah, we actually, at some point, we'll probably end up doing a more in-depth roach video also. But generally, our roaches get uh, a mixture of oats, uh, rabbit food. Some people even give them dog food. Just any, any decent quality protein source. Uh, along with water crystals and fruits and vegetables and greens. So they actually eat the same food that our sale fins eat. And we mostly just do roaches, mealworms, and superworms. Primarily roaches, though. Right. Very well-rounded, nutritionally, easy to breed, um, not too fast. They're not biters. They're just, we've talked about this before, but as far as a feeder insect goes... I do not know of anything better than a dubia roach. Oh, I yeah. just we swear yeah. by them. <laughs> Such a great feeder insect. And also, the... as far as dusting uh, for oh, right calcium D three, yeah. you know, multivitamin supplements, we generally do it with with the insects, with the roaches, because it's it's a little easier to overdose on that if you're just dumping it on a salad versus just a fine coating of of shaking up some roaches and having them in that. So that's that's kind of how we deal with the supplemental. Uh, calcium and all that with the cell fins and with the monitors and anything that needs that. So. What is the frequency that you dust? Well, she actually gets the calcium supplement more than any anyone else and that's just because she lays eggs like you wouldn't believe. I mean, we in the last year, I bet she's had more than 40 eggs, yeah. probably around 40. And, you know, almost all of those were slugs because in the beginning she wasn't being bred and then when we did start breeding, uh, our male self in Salvador to her, she, uh, we, we think that he probably just wasn't quite fertile yet, and so the first several breedings, the eggs were still duds. Then her previous cycle, we ended up getting one fertile egg that ended up dying in the egg just like a week or less before it hatched, and we were pretty upset about that, but uh, we actually have a full fertile clutch of six in the incubator right now, and we have everything dialed in, and we're hopeful that that'll be more successful but yeah she uh, she gets the calcium more often because she has 
eggs that she needs to form so often. Uh, generally, I'll give her a dusting right after she lays, and at least every couple weeks in addition to that. Um, and then the multivitamin is, is much more infrequent, you know, every month or two, uh, depending on, on the lizard and their size and everything, so. Um, one note on that. <laughs> We, you might look up things on this and people are telling you to dust every other meal. We do not because their food that we offer them on a daily basis right. is incredibly diverse. Uh, again, I've said this before, Sophie is the most spoiled animal in our collection. Her diet is perfection. It's as close as we can get to the variety and quality that she would be eating in the wild where obviously they never get calcium dusted onto their food. So if we were giving her subpar food, which unfortunately omnivorous lizards in captivity usually get subpar food, we would have to dust more frequently. Right. Um, but because her food and Salvador's and even the monitors is such high quality, we do not dust as often uh, as you often hear about simply because it's not needed and we'd want to avoid overdosing on any particular nutrient or vitamin. Also, um, some, a note to put in there is that we, because we breed mice for all the ball pythons, we have uh, baby, you know, pinky mice on hand at any given time and once or twice a month all of the lizards will get a treat and have a mouse day instead of a, an insect mm -hmm. day. And you can't do that very often because they're, they have a much higher fat content but they also are a lot higher in calcium than most of the other things that they get fed. So that's another... And even occasional baby quail and yeah. quail eggs yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, now that we got the quail going. Pretty right. Good. So as far as their temperature gradient, again, that you'll find a couple differences in, in what people will recommend. Just as kind of a general ballpark, uh, you do want a gradient, as with almost any reptile that you're going to keep. Uh, just rough overall rule of thumb is nighttime temperature is about 70 to 80, daytime temperature is about 80 to 90, and then a hot spot of about 110 to 120. And you need to have a good sized cage, one, just to be able to have that temperature gradient and have different places throughout the day and, and throughout their cage that are, are different. Uh, and also because, you know, they're a larger lizard and they climb and they're, they're kind of, you know, all over the place. They're almost like semi-arboreal and semi-aquatic. <laughs> it's true. Uh, it's you know, true. in the wild they find them by rivers and trees, kind of all over the place, so. Walk us through her cage. Tell us the dimensions. Yeah. And specifically, with this, it's okay, Sophie. With the screen top, how do you keep the humidity up? Because it's there. high. It's high humidity in here. I'm going to put her back in there real quick. Okay. So we can kind of see her in the roach. Yeah. yeah. And this is another thing, kind of, if she isn't paying attention and I just go to grab her and she doesn't see me, she'll still kind of, you know, panic oh, yeah, a little yeah, bit yeah. if she doesn't know what's going on. So one thing I do is make sure she sees me, give her something to, to chew on <laughs> before I pick her up when she's down on the ground. If she has any interest, maybe. Uh, the other thing to note, she is much more comfortable when she cannot see Salvador. <laughs> He's been banging on the glass. You may have heard him during this whole video and we'll get him out next uh, so you guys can see him. But uh, their breeding is not as gentle as the monitors. And so uh, at the beginning of her cycle, when she's super receptive, it's easy. Just put her in there and, and they breed and it's, it's easy going. But later on, when she's already got eggs developing, um, when she sees him and he still wants to breed, it stresses her out uh, and she does not want anything to do with getting bred at that point. And so uh, when we rearrange this room, we're going to set them up so that they cannot see each other from their enclosures. Um, yeah. And I think that she'll be even more comfortable. Anyway, I think so Caleb's going to put her back yeah. um, and we'll show you inside her cage. So this is one of the few species that can actually run on the water. Um, let's take a look at her back foot. There. So crazy looking. It's like a paddle. Yeah. So you, everyone's heard of basilisk lizards being able right. to do that. But uh, the sail fins also can 
briefly run on the water. So they'll like drop out of a tree, for example, if something's coming at them, and then uh, take off across the water. You know, and she's pretty calm, so she, she doesn't really move around very quickly, but they are still pretty agile. I mean, I've seen her on this branch right here. If I have a, a food dish with roaches, I've seen her swing off, hang from this branch with her back legs, and just be dangling there eating out of her <laughs> dish. So she is definitely agile. So I don't know if it'd be easier if I close this or if you're actually in here. Yeah, let me just stick the camera in there so we can see what we've got. Mostly just climbing branches. So we got her lay box right here in the middle. Basking spot where she's on right now and just, yeah, as Colin was saying, just some branches. So we have a light just to provide some extra brightness in here. We have a UV light and we have a heat bulb for a hot spot over on this basking area over here. So we have a good temperature gradient. There's a lot of area in the upper half of the cage if she wants to be warmer. She can be at the hot spot where it's about 115, 120. She can be over on this side where it's more like 90 or down at the bottom where it's about 80. And then during the nighttime, our temperatures drop to about 74 at the bottom to about 80 at the top and she spends significant time in every single Part oh, yeah. of this temperature yeah. gradient. So she clearly uh, Regulates herself. We used to have live plants in here. She ate every single oh, leaf. Yeah. She, she, <laughs> she ate did. every plant We made sure obviously that they were all edible, but she she loved that. Oh, that is another thing to point out um don't put fake plants in with sailfins because they are omnivores and if they try to eat a plastic plant, it will not go well right. and they will digest it and it, it could cause impactions. So they are definitely one that you want to only put live plants in. And if you do, make sure it's a plant that it would be okay if they did eat. So Right. So yeah, Big water basin. Oh yeah. So their water, that's another thing. It looks, it looks like there's a little bit of you know, stuff in there right now. I actually just changed it about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they drink and poop and pee all in their water dish. So you need to have a large area so that it's not disgusting and it needs to get changed every single day. So that is, that is a very important thing to have for them. And this is, this is about the minimum that they'll really be comfortable with is a, a big dish that they can fully submerse in. If you have the space and the time and the money to have kind of a vivarium that's set up where, where you have a whole water feature that they can swim around in, that would be perfect. And that is actually what we want to move towards, uh, especially with our sail fins. But at, at a minimum, you need to have a large kind of oversized tub this actually fits about four gallons of water in it that I change out every single day and wipe it down. So that is something that you have to keep in mind if you do want one as a pet, that they are kind of a, a medium to advanced care in, in that, you know, they need a very wide variety of food. They need a lot of space. They need a temperature gradient. They need a large area for their water and it needs to be changed out every day. So something to keep in mind if you're interested in them. So before any of you panic that our entire roof in here is screen, <laughs> explain to us, Caleb, how the humidity in her cage stays super, super high. So I don't know if you got a good, a good shot of it, but we have uh, a, a mixture of sphagnum and uh, reptichip, which is really just kind of a, a ch cocoa chunk. Um, and both of those are very good at holding and slowly dispersing moisture and humidity. So we actually keep temperature and humidity gauges in all of our cages and we uh, have lines of humidifiers running into all of our cages and I can actually keep an eye on the bedding itself and if it seems like it's drying out at all kind of spray the whole thing down with our uh, with our sprayer and it just holds on to moisture well enough that uh, the, the humidity never really drops below about 60%. And, and you do actually want, it's kind of the same idea as with the temperature gradient. You want it, there to kind of be natural fluctuations as long as it doesn't get too dry. You know, if, if you have regularly, especially where we are, you know, in the winter in Alaska, it can get down to 15% relative humidity, which is just insane. It's almost like qualifies as a desert. And, uh, 
so we really need to stay on top of the humidity in here. It, you can have, you know, if, if they have layers of uh, skin sh that should have shed off, especially around their toes that aren't coming off, it can slowly constrict as it layer and layer builds up and it can actually cause them to have toes fall off. It can cause all kinds of problems. So the ridges on their back, it can pinch the ridges off, it can pinch their toes off. So you really got to make sure that the humidity is in a good range, which is generally about uh, 90 to 60 uh, of, a, of a fluctuation. You know, a little higher or a little lower at any given time isn't going to be the end of the world. You just want to make sure that in general, throughout the day, it's staying in about that range. So, And we like to impact the humidity a lot with foggers. Right. We do spray, of course, but people who only spray, every surface of the right. cage is actually wet right. at all times, and that also is not good. They get fungus problems, they just have skin problems in general. Uh, so a combination of foggers going, and by the way, we humidify this entire room. The yes. whole room is around 60% humidity at any given time, and then the cages get an extra boost of even more humidity. All right, why don't I pause the video and you can grab Salvador okay. um, and we'll finish up. So we ended up pulling Salvador out, but he just was a little uncomfortable and his cage was still open and he actually just ended up running right back in there. So we just <laughs> didn't, we didn't, we didn't want to bother him anymore. We'll probably throw that little clip just because it looks, you know, he gives a good show of how agile and nimble they are. But uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's about it. Um, We'll give updates when the eggs right. are due. Right, yeah, when a little bit closer to uh, to when the eggs are due. Um, when is that going to be? Let's see, it's been three, two weeks? We'll have to look it up, I don't yeah. remember. So, so the eggs, the incubation for the eggs is about three months. Uh, we have them incubating at about 83 degrees, and I have actually been in contact with uh, Scott Corning for the last probably year and a half, just emailing back and forth. Uh, and he's kind of one of the first really big name guys that, that got involved in this species and where a lot of the information comes for them. So, you know, if you guys have any, any other questions or anything about this, you can check out, uh, you know, his website. I think it's sylphandragon.com and he's posted stuff on Reptiles Magazine and or he has articles on Reptiles Magazine and uh, care sheets and stuff. So most of the, most of the information you can find uh, published anywhere is from Scott Corning, um, and then there are you know some other breeders on Facebook and Instagram that you can find. But yeah, uh, we are hoping to get a clutch of six babies in sometime about mid uh, summer. So we'll keep you guys updated. Uh, until next time, we're the Reptile Bar.